Thank you, and welcome to our session today, which is part two of the motivational interviewing uh, session that we began in December with part one. Uh, our presenter this morning is April Lynch with Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, some of you may be aware, we pre-record these just to be on the safe side. And in this case, unfortunately, Ms. Lynch, illness is going to prevent her from being part of our live Q&A. Although Dr. Wagner, uh, who was our presenter in December, has graciously uh, agreed to fill in. So he will be managing the Q question and answering after the session is done. Uh, the recording is an hour. And when that is done, I will turn it over to Heidi Decker Maurer, who you see on your screen, and she and Dr. Wagner will uh, answer your questions. As to questions, uh, please ask questions while the uh, during the recording during the presentation, uh, and you can enter those in the Q and A box. Uh, if you have technical questions, please put those in the chat box. But if you happen to put a question in chat and technical and Q&A, not a problem. We're monitoring both of those boxes. Um, the, uh, after, again, uh, uh, Heidi will facilitate the Q&A session. Dr. Wagner can say a few words about himself. Then um, a reminder that we record all of these sessions, um, uh, both the uh, presentation as well as the question and answer. And we post those on the Project E3 website in the community of practice. Uh, it takes us a couple of weeks. We need to confirm that the closed captioning is synchronized, uh, not just with the recording, but with the Q&A session. Uh, at about five minutes before the end of the session, or when questions seem to be done, uh, we will, I will turn it, I will come back on, I will turn it over to Jennifer gunlach Klot, which will give you a brief explanation about how you can get CRC credits for this particular session. So without that, we will go ahead now and get started with the session. Uh, please, again, if you have questions while you're watching the presentation, please put them in the Q&A. Um, Ms. decker Maurer and Dr. Wagner will probably be able to answer a few questions uh, during the presentation, as well as during the live Q&A afterwards. So thanks again for participating, and we uh, look forward to you joining us in the future as well. Hello, my name is April Lynch and I work for Rehabilitation Research and Training Center at Virginia Commonwealth University. Today we are going to be looking at motivational interviewing as a tool for the vocational rehabilitation process and we're going to explore three different case studies where these strategies have been found effective to help clients resolve feelings of amb ambivalence and work towards their area of positive change. So starting out just thinking of the overall idea of using motivational interviewing as a tool to seek change. And a lot of our clients that are accessing VR services are coming to seek change or a meaning or sense of purpose. Um, it is our job as VR counselors to really figure out exactly what that meaning and purpose is and what those different changes would look like based on the client's values, beliefs, and strengths. Uh, most of our clients also are looking to specifically achieve a goal. So how they may be supported in achieving these goals is our job as well as be our counselors to uh, implement those objectives and find out the most successful strategies that will guide them to um, achieve that ultimate goal that they implemented. Uh, and we are going to be exploring motivational interviewing throughout this presentation on how these uh, particular clients were able to achieve their goals through uh, the counselor using these strategies. So taking a look at the overall idea of the spirit of motivational interviewing uh, really starts with the spirit of the counselor and how they set the tones of their meetings with their clients. Uh, it's a time to really create a safe and supportive a space for your client to feel comfortable with um, building rapport with you as a counselor, but then also starting to begin that momentum of working towards change. Uh, the different types of uh, motivational interviewing uh, that you want to be including in this time as well with um, 
focusing on the overall spirit of the counselor and the MI strategy is incorporating compassion, acceptance, partnership, and respect throughout your meetings with your clients and uh, really just getting to know them through that process of building rapport. Um, but one thing that is really important to focus on during this time is to be aware of what we call the writing reflex. And this is often when a counselor feels the need to uh, fix everything and, and really just problem solve for their clients. And uh, we say that in MI that counselors should not persuade, advise without permission, or attempt to change their client by fixing their problems. Um, this may at times, you need to switch gears though, because MI strategy may be effective for your client at one point in time during the case, but you may at times have to switch gears to more of a solution focused uh, problem solving. And that would allow you to work through more systematic challenges that might be going on in a job site or um, whatever may be occurring with the client where a more systematic approach to break down uh, different steps to a process to help them accomplish that goal. Um, so sometimes it's important to switch gears to a more solution focused approach, but uh, just being aware of that when you are in that spirit of the MI and you are really trying to be compassionate and accepting towards your client and evoking these strengths and values from them, um, just be sure to recognize when you're wearing different types of hats in the counseling field. So we know that uh, motivational interviewing is encompassed through a client-centered communication approach, and we use a strategy called ORS. So this stands, an acronym that stands for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, or reflective listening, and summarizing or summaries. Uh, so really the goal with this type of communication allows the counselor to express empathy through that reflective listening. You're really uh, listening to your client's story and hearing their experience and, and really trying to pick up on those different values and beliefs and strengths they have about themselves. Um, also, you're using this time to develop any discrepancies between clients' goals and values and current behavior that might be uh, potentially you know, not matching up exactly with what they're saying and what their values are. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit later when we're exploring the case study examples of how this may have come up in certain cases. Um, also, we want to avoid any arguing or having direct confrontation with clients when we're communicating with them. Um, if you find that resistance is coming up, that can be natural because making life decisions is really tough and uh, that's when our empathy comes in and really understanding that these clients are going through a lot of tough decision making and um, if resistance comes up that can be normal but we just need to adjust our style and approach to it at that point in time and roll with the resistance um, to ultimately support their self-efficacy self and optimism we really would like to focus on allowing the client to recognize that they can achieve goals and to instill hope that that is possible. Uh, so using this form of client-centered communication uh, throughout sessions with your clients can really, um, again, express that empathy, establish that rapport, and just create that safe opportunity to continue learning more and more about your client. So another area that you might want to be focusing on when you're meeting with your clients, uh, this may be initially or, you know, you could be working with this clients for years. Um, it really, you know, varies case to case, but when you're trying to identify the different areas of change that they want to work towards, um, you want to be listening for what we call change talk. So um, what is their desire to change? What is their ability to change? What are their reasons? What are their needs? And you can really focus in on this type of talking by paying attention to key phrases that your clients might be saying. So um, if they're saying a phrase, you know, I, I really want to start working, then at that point we're pulling out, I want to work as your current desire. And taking a little bit further with recognizing statements such as, I could do this, that's when you're picking up on their abilities and what exactly they feel like they might be good at in their job search or um, obtaining employment. And what are their reasons for change? This could vary case to case as well. Some of our clients may have had previous VR experience, which I'm gonna explain a little bit about that later in another case study. Um, but they could have various reasons for coming and, and various reasons for why they want a new job or to even start employment. So really uh, picking up on that talk as well um, about what their reasons are and then next what their needs are, what they have to be doing to really uh, 
be performing their best to their ability and uh, reaching their goals day by day that they're hoping to. So again, just really listening for those key words uh, to promote that idea of the client is ready for change. So when you're hearing these types of phrases, um, continue to try to help your client work towards activation. So being ready to start making these changes, commitment, they actually are making these changes, and then taking the steps so the process is really getting going as far as what they need to be doing to help them achieve those goals um, based on their strengths, values, and beliefs. So taking a look at the different types of stages of change, uh, this could be helpful for understanding exactly where your client is because we really want to meet our client where they are. And, and you know, a person has to be ready for change. So we meet them at that point and you can take a look at these different stages, uh, pre-contemplation, uh, stage is when they're really trying to start to decide whether this is something they want to do. Um, so in the employment idea, you know, this may be a client coming in that's still in high school, um, very early age, uh, transition age services, and this could be a time for them where they're really not quite sure if work is even something that they want to do. Um, so their values may not be currently aligning with the goal to achieve work or to achieve obtaining employment, but we can meet them as the counselor where they are and start to try to pull out those values and strengths and show them that working towards that change of obtaining employment can be based on what they want. They do have that choice. They do have that autonomy. So the pre-contemplation phase, phase may be a little uh, tricky, but again, uh, just depending on what type of case that per particular client is in, meet them where they are. So then you can get them to work towards the contemplation phase of really considering what changes will benefit them and what will be very positive for their lifestyle. Uh, moving into the preparation phase from there, preparing to make these actions. So as far as um, the VR counselor side, uh, at this time you might be starting to prepare what a potential goal could look like for them um, based on their own values and strengths. Um, preparing their employment objectives and uh, coming up with a game plan to achieve these goals. And then moving into the action plan where you're actively implementing this plan. And then once we get into the maintenance phase, the client is uh, continuing to uh, keep up these positive changes that they've made and utilizing any support or coping strategies that are necessary for them to continue maintaining that positive change. Um, but also to know that even if they're in maintenance phase, they may want to uh, make other changes in the future. This cycle can continue on and on based on um, exactly where they are in their life and what changes they want to make for themselves. So looking at this quote to start off our first case study example, my reason for change was to prove it to myself. Um, this was said by the client that we're about to explore her story um, and how motivational interviewing was effective for her um, during certain times where self-esteem and confidence were very difficult um, to increase. So looking at this case study, it is about a stroke survivor, um, a young 32-year-old woman who survived multiple strokes and who is now coping with post-traumatic stress disorder and ongoing anxiety. Uh, she has met many milestones since working um, with VR services and also being able to um, experience how motivational interviewing really can increase her self-esteem and confidence and help her understand what her goals truly were. Um, so the way we started out meeting was going into the community because I wanted to give that autonomy and choice of the client and let them pick where was the most comfortable setting for them. Again, going back to that you know, first idea of creating a safe and supportive environment. Sometimes that's based on allowing the client to have choice of where they feel the most comfortable when you're meeting with them. So we would meet in the community. Um, it was usually weekly, but again, dependent on her schedule and whatnot. But we would meet and really um, just talk about her story Story and I would really exhibit empathy and compassion to what she went through because she had experienced three different strokes and each stroke was separated by a five-year increment. So there was this fear coming up of, is this going to be something that continues to happen for the rest of my life at every five-year increment? So of course coming in and, and searching for a job was something that was a little scary because her life had such a major setback. 
um, she was finishing up her last semester of her bachelor's degree when the first stroke occurred. And at this time, the doctors had told her she was just having stress headaches. And this caused her to continue to work through what she needed to do at school, but then later was told by another doctor she was having strokes. And it looked like she had fireworks going off in her brain. So all that she knew before in her areas of employment and her strengths and values almost all just kind of went away because this major setback that occurred in her life made her feel as if she did not have confidence or self-esteem to go forward with making any positive changes in her life. So her mom helped guide her to get into the VR services. And from there, we continued to just work closely together and uh, focus on exactly what she was hoping to get out of the experience. When we first started talking about her employment goal, she was hoping to just go back into a restaurant, uh, work as a hostess, um, do a secretary position in an office answering phones. And these were all positions that she had done in her past job history before she had had those strokes. So what I was hearing when I was working with her was that she was going to work in a restaurant or she was going to work in an office setting because that just felt like the easy route and that's something that she knew. And this fear kept coming up about how she was unsure of if she could move forward and succeed in any other area because she wasn't even able to finish her college degree. So a lot of our conversations were based around you did not have control over what happened to you, but you have control of what's happening to you now. And let's decide on what are some appropriate goals for you based on what you truly want for yourself. So we continued to meet and um, I would evoke as much change talk as I could as we were having our conversations. And I continued to hear her use change talk in the sense of a desire and that she desired to work with individuals with disabilities who had maybe gone through a similar experience as her or maybe even children with disabilities that are nonverbal and may have difficulty expressing what's going on with them because when she had her stroke, she lost her vision and her ability to speak. So going through that experience herself and me allowing to point out to her that she felt confident in how she survived her experience and this was kind of that breaking moment of where she, that breaking through where she noticed that this is something she truly desired and valued and based on her experience, she could turn that into a positive to then work towards achieving her goals of obtaining meaningful employment. So when talking with this client, a lot of the ambivalence that would come up was around the approach avoid conflict um, idea of I want to do this, but I'm also a little avoidant of doing it because I'm scared because making these decisions can be very difficult. And of course, we know that that fear was still manifesting from the anxiety and the PTSD. So some of the things that I would hear often in our conversations were I want to find a career, but I'm afraid of starting over from what I already know or I'm afraid of what people might think of me and I'm not gonna be accepted for now an individual that has a disability. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna be judged for having to process different than I used to. This was a common thing that would come up. She uh, processes different now that she is a survivor of three strokes and also with anxiety that comes up. Um, at times it takes her a little bit longer to think through how she's feeling and to process exactly her reaction to certain um, things that are coming up in her environment. And this was a common um, area where we had to continue to work through uh, recognizing that although it may take her longer to process at times, she would also be potentially working with individuals that may have this same barrier. And how can she use her own strengths to help them work through those barriers as well? And then another common thing was just saying that she was really afraid of the stressful changes that could occur with looking for employment or obtaining employment that might end up being a stressful environment. She is, of course, fearful that this could lead to another stroke. So um, keeping all of these things in mind, but still trying to um, just evoke all of that positive uh, change talk coming from the client so we can continue to work towards what she truly desires and what her abilities are and how that all matches. 
So uh, a main strategy I would use from ORs when working with this client was the open-ended question. So again, this would not be uh, asking yes or no questions. You really want to ask open-ended questions because you can evoke more from the client um, and really understand exactly where they are in that moment. So you can help them um, work through that moment of maybe to certainty or being really certain and um, giving them that affirmation. So asking different open questions that will really get um, that information that you need uh, to understand where that client currently is um, so you can continue working towards change. So just using open-ended questions as a tool to gather more information and really just gain that overall client perspective. So affirmations were a very important part of working with this particular client because self-esteem and confidence was something we were continuing to work on and receiving affirmations from her counselor was very helpful for her to then recognize exactly where she was feeling validated and where she could continue to um, work through these these areas of change that were hard because she was doing things that were beneficial to this process so knowing she had a choice in this process was something that was very helpful for her to continue to understand i'm not going to just throw you into any job i'm not going to you know make choices without you this is for you this is what you want um, and even if your family has a certain value or belief of what you should be doing and work um, how can we come together as a team and really make sure that this is still aligning with your own values and your own choices um, you know, really affirming that she was dedicated and consistent with communication and really just her overall willingness and commitment to this process um, and her resilience of wanting to return to work. Another important uh, thing to keep in mind with when you're using affirmations, vocally, yes, you are affirming the, the client based on uh, what needs to be validated. However, it's also important to keep in mind your body language, your voice tone, your eye contact are all forms of affirmations as well. Um, if you have your arms crossed and you're not you know, giving them much emotion on your face, that could feel um, as if you're not being affirming or validating in that moment. So really as a counselor too, just being aware of yourself, maybe doing a quick body scan of where you're at physically and mentally too before going into these sessions so you can be affirming and very warm with your clients. Using reflective listening with this particular individual was really helpful because you know when we mentioned earlier that she at times has uh, difficulty with processing and it takes her a little bit longer to um, really say what she means but when she does say it, it it's so beautiful and so powerful um, but through re using reflective listening I could really bounce these ideas back to her of what she was saying and and making sure that I was understanding exactly what she was hoping to get across and and really understanding exactly the areas of change she was working towards. So just a couple of examples of reflective listening used with this client. Um, it sounds like you want to help others but are afraid you may be seen as incompetent to help others. Um, this is coming up from her past fear of, you know, the idea of a stroke maybe in her um, a stroke, her stroke and her lack of processing at times, how that can get in the way of conversations and her initial responses to individuals. But then also just the overall idea of, am I competent enough because I wasn't able to finish my college degree because this unfortunate situation disrupted. So really just you know giving her that reflective listening in those moments so then I could still continue to understand where she was at and fully grasp those emotions and that perspective. Um, using the tool also of overstating or understating reflection. So at times, if you're, if you're really overstating your reflection, um, you're really going as far as trying to not only understand the client, but have them understand is that the, the thought that they're truly trying to get across. Um, and then, you know, with the understating, just trying to get a little bit more information out of them. Um, so if you're, if you're working with a client that may not be listening as much, um, understating can then cause them to say, well, no, that's not what I meant. I wanted, I wanted to give you uh, this thought. Or, and the same could happen with overstating. Um, if that's not what they meant, then they'll give you more information. And this tends to happen a lot with my client. Um, I really want to make sure that I'm getting everything that she's saying to me. And at times, overstating or understanding can really help with just getting all of that information about how she feels in the moment and um, you know just understanding her triggers and exactly how we can move past some of these negative thoughts that keep coming up and um, focus on the positive while implementing that in our change goals. 
Uh, using summarizing or summaries of what the client is saying is basically the stepping stones to change. Uh, when I was working with this client, I feel like this really became just the tool to transition from one topic to the next um, and really allow the client to understand exactly how she was going to be preparing for change. Um, you know, so here's what I've heard so far. Tell me if I'm missing anything. You want to try something new but are afraid of changing from your comfort zone and failing. So once we were able to recognize, oh yes, you know, I am kind of still staying in this comfort zone of these types of jobs because it's what, what I know, but I've survived a lot. So let's keep going and see what positive changes I can keep working through. Um, and that is when we went on to obtaining employment and finding a position that was a little bit more fitting uh, with her values and her strengths. She was getting to use her amazing, compassionate personality, her empathy, um, by working with children in a school system and a special education department. And her experience was allowing her to put herself in a position to then maybe even evoke the own feelings of the students she was working with and, and what experience they were going through at that time. Um, so once obtaining employment and then feeling secure and stable and independent and autonomous in the whole process, um, we then look at the maintenance, the maintenance stage, like we had talked about earlier in the stages of change. Um, and this client has been successfully employed in her job um, for about two years now. And she is in the maintenance stage of change, which means she continues to utilize what skills have really helped her find those positive changes. Um, she finds that uh, her spiritual side is very important to her. So making sure um, she's attending church once a week, um, going to a prayer group with her colleagues and peers, um, which also allows that environment of work to, to continue to be supportive and fostering of her faith and um, allow her to kind of stay away from those negative thoughts of something negative could happen and this could lead me into another uh, stroke. Uh, so having those coping strategies in place, but then also continuing to have monthly uh, motivational interviewing based meetings with me as the counselor and really just checking in and trying to decide whether there are any other areas of change that uh, the client would like to be working through. Um, and she also is attending individual therapy weekly, utilizing grounding and mindfulness techniques to help with her anxiety and her emotional regulation. Um, and again, just a con continuing to adjust to those life changes. Um, since using MI strategies with this client, um, she has obtained successful employment and kept it. Uh, began the process of um, thinking of going back to school to finish that last semester and then start her master's degree. She has become married and she now owns a house. So lots of milestones have been met by this individual because she is resilient and she was able to create those positive changes. Um, it was all within her. It just took the counselor bringing out and evoking those values and strengths to increase that confidence and get away from any of those insecurities and ambivalence that was occurring. Um, so next up, I am going to invite out Dr. Christopher Wagner, and he's going to be joining me to do a little bit of dialogue on this particular case. Thanks for joining me today, Chris, sure. to talk about my different cases and the and my strategies I've been using. Sure. And uh, for those of you who don't know, my, I'm Chris Wagner. I am a clinical psychologist and certified rehabilitation counselor. Um, had done an earlier uh, webinar on MI and VR that's kind of set up for April to do the follow-up focusing on specific cases. Um, I'm curious what, as you were working with her, what did you identify as any potential risks of the work? It sounds like one was you were concerned she would kind of undersell herself, get into a job that would maybe be easy early on, but wouldn't really satisfy her. Um, yeah, early on I knew it was a satisfaction piece. Right. I felt like if we just placed her in an office setting or, I mean, potentially those jobs could have been great for her because of the skill set, right. but would it be fulfilling? And that's really what we were looking for. We wanted to find something that, that was fulfilling because her college experience was disrupted where mm -hmm. she was going to go on to make all of these changes to find that fulfillment in herself. So I wanted to get her back to that point. Right. Um, once we were in employment, 
the biggest risk was the triggers that might come up with working okay. with individuals um, that may have seizures or stroke or seizures themselves because they're adolescents. Um, and when she was triggered in those moments, it would kind of bring her back to that point of when she did have the stroke herself. Yeah. Um, so those were risks that we wanted to really work with her employer on as okay. far as recognizing if a situation like this occurs, ha what's a safety plan okay. to have in place? And that I think brought a lot more comfort to her too. Okay. So um, I, I'm curious along the way, we didn't really specifically talk about the writing reflex, but this notion of the writing reflex in MI, which is um, you know, just a concern that we have, a, we have a very compassionate sense as counselors often to want to help people, to want to take things that are wrong and set them right, to um, want to take things that are broken and fix them, or if somebody's hurting, to, to support them. Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge is, as you know, sometimes that can override um, strategies for what's the best long-term outcome. So I guess I'm just wondering, from your perspective, did you were there writing reflexes you had to suppress with her? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think writing reflex is something that comes up for me quite a bit mm -hmm. um, because you know being in vocation, uh, you really have to kind of wear different hats at times, and at times you do have to be solving problems and working through a systematic approach with the client. But when it comes to the writing reflex and me wanting to fix all these problems, I have to recognize in that moment, okay, what can I get from the client that I don't have to be giving them this. I, mm -hmm. I can see it's within them. I just have to evoke it from them. Right. And then that's really what's going to guide us to success. Yeah. So those times when maybe she, with, when her confidence was low, you might be pulled to reassure her or kind of mm -hmm. either if you don't necessarily buy into the lowered expectations and you, you were, sounds like, well aware of that at the beginning to help her through that experience that might be awkward and uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, for a little bit. Uh, but then kind of get to the other side and so she could really flourish. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I was a little bit of a moral encouragement weekly for yeah. her, whether it was text, phone call, email, um, whatever was working best for her that week with scheduling and her work schedule. But um, yeah, I definitely think that I continue to be that instrument to just provide encouragement and, and help, help be her sounding board yeah. really when she needs it to figure out what is the next step of change. Yeah, it was really fantastic. Um, story to listen to, uh, kind of she's getting her back inspiring. on her pathway and how well she's doing. So I look forward to hearing the next couple. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at this next case study and we'll start it out with a quote from the client. I love my job. I love working with all of my coworkers because we all are creative. They just get me. This is what I hear very often from this particular individual when visiting him at his job. So this case study is about a young man with autism who ultimately receives his dream job. Um, when I first met him, um, he was really describing a lot about himself, but um, you could tell he was a little bit more reserved, introverted. Um, it was a little bit more difficult to try to bring out these different um, responses about what his strengths were, what his values were, um, why he really wanted to go back to work. Um, but with the help of his support team, I was able to gather a lot of great information about the fact that he's an artist, um, he's a painter, a photographer, he's in a local performing arts group. Um, so ultimately he really thrives in that creative and accepting environment. Um, so something I found out the reason why it was a little difficult as to why I could pull out those different values and strengths about this individual from him personally um, was because he had a previous VR experience that wasn't uh, a positive job match. Um, we could still look at this as he received this job to get experience. It was a first job and um, he learned potential barriers that might get into the way of his success. Um, so again, I don't want to call it a bad experience because it was a growth opportunity um, and it allowed us to continue on with figuring out exactly what that positive change was that he was seeking to gain that um, meaningful employment. So once learning a little bit more about him um, and his artistic abilities, I hit the ground running as far as trying to find a position in that area and continuing to work with him to build that rapport and help him feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, Definitely what I saw coming up a lot with his ambivalence was the avoid, avoid conflict approach. So um, what was happening is after he had that positive job match and then he 
uh, or the, the job match that was not positive. Um, and he left that position. He was um, left feeling a bit discouraged because it unfortunately ended in termination. It didn't match his strengths. Um, it just wasn't a very fulfilling experience. So it left him feeling a little um, resistant to the VR process and what that could potentially look like for him. Um, but what he was continuing to do was volunteer at the SPCA, um, a local organization um, that works with animals. And he was working there since 2014 in a volunteer position that he knew very well. He knew everyone in the environment very well. And you know he gets to be around animals all day. So it was awesome. Um, so why leave this comfortable volunteer position if you know, money really wasn't the object, that wasn't really the goal. Um, his goal was to find a comfortable environment that didn't bring him stress. And so why leave this great volunteer experience to go find a job that might ultimately lead him back into that same feeling of hopelessness and insecurity and ambivalence about this whole process when he um, goes back into the VR process? What if, what if going into the VR process isn't going to be different this time? It might be exactly the same. Um, so working with him to really recognize that we could foster his strengths, and even if he did have previous employment that he wasn't the most fond of, we can you know, use that as a growth opportunity and keep moving forward. Um, so again, just thoughts that were coming up from him were, does he really want to even make this change and start all over again when he feels comfortable in the volunteer position that he had? Um, not only was he volunteering at the SPCA, but he also was volunteering at a local art store um, where he was getting to be around art supplies all day, which is super motivating. And there was only like two employees. So um, he didn't have to deal with, you know, a lot of um, having to use his personality, which made him uncomfortable because of past experiences. So uh, again, him just being worried too about creating new routines for himself and really just the overall idea of change is scary and it can be really hard to do. So the types of strategies I used with this particular client was really uh, engaging him on what his values and his strengths are. So um, taking a look first at his values and how um, I really evoked these different responses from him. Um, our first initial meeting, um, the intake process, uh, he was a little bit more, um, like I said, reserved and not as open about his responses. But as I continued to build rapport with him and connect with him as an individual, I could really um, start to ask him questions that would get a little bit more of a response of where we could start to understand what um, his change goals would be. So what was most important to him was his artistic skill set. So being a painter and doing his photography, he recognized that these skills um, really brought a lot of joy to him, but also um, he didn't feel anxious when he's doing these skills. So. Um, Another value of his was the type of environment and being in something that is comfortable, but then he described it as chaotic free. Um, so not a lot of noise and you know, just again, uh, being a fostering supportive environment. And then what exactly would be most fulfilling for him, again, was using his creativity, his artistic skill set, and being in a creative environment. So then pairing that in with his different strengths and really getting him to uh, start to express what he really is good at and he has great time management skills being creative attention to detail organization and dedication to any project he does because um, he does do some freelance um, art work and things like that so also um, getting him to recognize once he was able to say these strengths of his how he was going to be able to use these types of strengths and the goal with this would be to find employment that then would promote him having more happiness and positive energy. Um, really, I think he just didn't want to be put into another stressful situation and how we could continue to focus on making this a positive experience. Um, so engaging and focusing him to recognize what his strengths were, his values, so we could continue to move through that process to plan. Again, evoking uh, during the engaging and focusing process too, so we can get as much information as possible. If you ask this client yes or no questions, it's going to be yes or no, and that's it. He's not going to, you know, um, really elaborate much on that. So it's your job as the counselor to really try and get more information out of them by using those open-ended questions, but also in the evoking approach that you know it's going to evoke 
exactly on the topic that you're working in at that time. So what do you want for yourself? That would evoke exactly what he wants himself in that job or different characteristics like the work culture, the type of people he wants to be around, what makes him happy. You know, he would tell me what makes him happy is getting to be unique and weird and, and dress in all different types of colors. So that was another thing that um, was a little bit different than looking for a cookie cutter position. Um, what brings you joy and what makes you feel good. So um, some other strategies that I would use during the evoking stage with this client was having him do a body scan, recognize where he was noticing any um, physical reactions when he was feeling anxious. If we were going out in the community to visit employment settings, go on interviews, whatever the situation might be, um, using this to help him recognize that he was in control still and he was safe. Um, and I was there as a support to help him recognize when he did feel uncomfortable and we could take a break. Um, and then using envisioning to really just tell me what he wants that job to look like. Um, since he's artistic and enjoys painting and doing photography, my thought with using envisioning with him is paint me a picture of what your perfect job is but in your mind and then say it out loud to me. And honestly, I would have even let him paint the picture for me if he wanted to do it that approach. Again, it's adjusting to where your client is and how you can best support them in that moment to evoke what values and strengths are going to be effective in the change process. Um, so really envisioning what that environment looked like helped me as the counselor identify different settings that could be really um, fostering to what he was hoping to get in an employment setting. So then at that point, we're going into the planning stage. We're implementing the plans for positive change. Um, I'm asking him how he can be supported through this process. Again, um, that's me being with him uh, through the interviews. Um, another area of support that he requested at this time was instead of doing a verbal interview, which is where you know you do a classic interview where you're sitting on a panel and you're answering questions about yourself, um, we did what is called a working interview. So that's where the client allows um, the employer to see them use their skill set and then the employer can then assess whether they're going to be a positive match for that position or if they could potentially create something in their employment setting that would match this client's strengths. Um, so the way he wanted to be supported through this was getting to physically do the work and show that as his interview experiences. Um, so our first working interview we did ended up being a successful placement for him. And um, this was in a creative, quiet environment and the individual um, now gets to do some production style work that's really um, focusing on his strengths with attention to detail, but then also bringing in some of those creative components and letting him um, do creative projects there and be a part of any uh, videography or photography occurring. So again, pulling and planning out exactly how we can bring in that, that creative skill set that is so valuable to him. Um, and really just how it overall aligns with his strengths and me as the counselor continuing to encourage him through this process um, while he is going on these interviews and, and working towards gaining that position. Um, so through this planning process, he obtained successful employment, um, has been working there long term um, in a position that he values so much and they in turn value him for his strengths. Um, so just taking a look at the maintenance uh, phase stage for this client, uh, recognizing how using art as an outlet has been really beneficial for him to continue working towards any positive change in his life and maintaining the positive change that's already occurred. Um, you know, just making sure that he's also keeping open communication with his team at work, but then also myself as the counselor and anyone else that's a part of his support team. So then if we do need to um, have another monthly meeting for uh, motivational interviewing strategies to get him back on track with that positive change if anything were to be disrupted. Um, but at this time, we're, we're just seeing each other at a monthly basis and if anything needs to increase, we can definitely do that. Um, and then involving this client as in, in as many creative projects as possible. Um, so he has got to be in a lot of different video opportunities and um, just different activities uh, through this entire process of gaining meaningful employment that has really highlighted his strengths. So particularly you, uh, your cue to use MI strategies when you notice uh, your, your client is stuck a little bit, the mm -hmm. consumer is stuck a little bit and it seems like something's not quite clicking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like in this situation where he was stuck with even the idea of pursuing employment again mm -hmm. because he felt like he had kind of been burned before. He had had a negative experience. And um, so getting 
recognizing that as that was the point where we needed to start working towards some change because he was just kind of stuck in this right. volunteer position for 15 years. Right. And, you know. So. And how, so I guess you're still getting to know him at that point. So how do you, uh, how do you know if he just doesn't uh, feel good about working, et cetera, versus if it's, he's having a specific reaction to a past bad experience that you can help him reframe and kind of work through? I think noticing his physical changes, because when I'm with him, I can recognize when he starts to get nervous mm -hmm. and his speech changes. And so different physical things that come up, um, yeah. being aware of that, and then just having empathy towards it too when it's occurring, right. um, recognizing that he might be uncomfortable and, and how, how can we readjust um, the topic right. to have him still have this be a positive experience, if right. that makes sense. So, that, so that's your cue. And then how do you go about eliciting... Um, uh, issues about importance and confidence for him. How do you fit that into the conversation? Is it natural? Do you draw attention that, oh, I notice it seems like you're stuck here and I wonder if we would take a few minutes to talk about that? How, how do you kind of make that transition? Uh, yeah, I usually describe what I'm seeing. I will make a description of, I can see right now that you're feeling uncomfortable about what's going on with this particular situation okay. and, and how can we um, get you back to a place of feeling comfortable so we can keep moving okay. towards progress. Mm -hmm. So really, I think it's just being aware. It goes back to that initial state of building rapport, being compassionate and empathetic to what your client's going through, right. and how you can accept them even in their tough times. And know that the decisions they're making are really hard to make, and, and how can you make it the most comfortable, safe experience for right. them. And so that kind of just probably comes through to him, that you don't when things get stuck, you don't push into, let, well, let's solve this mode, but you actually step back and we'll slow down the pace a little bit, it sounds like, and say, let's sit in this for a minute and discuss that. He actually got to be on a video project recently, and I got to hear his experience of how he, you know, feels about me. Right. <laughs> and he said that he really feels like I sit and listen to him okay. and, and just take in what he's saying and, and get to know him for yeah. who he is. And he didn't have that in his past experience. Okay. So. That feels good to hear. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a look at our final case study for the day, and we're going to start it off again with a quote from the client. Uh, this was a quote that she would often say to me uh, when we first met, and it was, I'll do anything. So that's pretty much music to a VR counselor's ears because you think, wow, they're receptive to doing any type of job and um, let's you know, just get them placed. But that's not our goal, right? Our goal is to really work with the client on aligning with their values and their strengths. And uh, now we're going to take a, look, a closer look at how we did that with this client. So this particular individual is a woman, uh, 60 years old, with multiple sclerosis. And the difficulty with adjusting to change here was her physical changes that were occurring. Um, with her condition, uh, there was a lot changing as far as um, just with her stamina, her endurance, her ability to lift, um, her ability to walk for certain periods of time, uh, sometimes wanting to sit, but then all of a sudden her body feels like it needs to stretch. Um, so very tricky with uh, recognizing all of these physical changes that were continuing to occur um, over time um, and how we could continue to foster the strengths of her mind while helping her recognize these physical changes that were occurring and that we could still work through those barriers and uh, help her find a goal that would be achievable based on her strengths. Um, so really throughout this case, working with this client has been um, just helping her recognize those discrepancy between what's happening physically with her and what she's saying out loud that she wants to do. Um, a particular example of that would be uh, when we first started working together, she had a history of working in restaurants. And she thought, okay, I can still do restaurant experience because that's what I have on my resume, that's what I've done. But it had been years since she had worked in that type of um, employment setting. And with the idea of working in a restaurant, that brings safety concerns because floors can be wet. Um, you know, you have to wear slip resistant shoes in a restaurant setting. There's, it's a chaotic environment. There's a lot going on. Um, and this can be the perfect job for some people. And it might still be a perfect job for her in a sense because of her personality, but wasn't matching up with physical limitations that were occurring. Um, so 
when she would be saying this quote to me over and over, I'll do anything. I'll just, whatever you can get me, April, I'm just ready to work. I'll, I'll work in any restaurant. She would line up um, visits to go to dish pits and restaurants and try out dishwashing um, or, you know, folding silver, whatever the restaurant needs were for that day. Um, but again, it continued to not match up with what was happening physically to her. And at the end of the day, she was feeling just exhausted and mentally overwhelmed because of how physically exhausted she was. So that value that she had of her personality and how she's such a lively individual and so fun to be around, that was being taken over by the physical exhaustion that was occurring because of her condition she's adjusting to. So using envisioning with this client was really helpful because although she hadn't experienced working in other jobs, she could envision what it could look like for her if she was in a different job outside of a restaurant setting. And again, although that was her experience, we can continue to make new experiences that are based on your strengths. So using different questions, again, the open-ended question style uh, through ORs, but then also um, making sure that you are using some statements in there too, like tell me about your perfect job. Um, so just really trying to get the client to recognize some areas that could be um, motivating to them, environment-wise, task-wise, the type of work culture, the people they're around. Um, for this particular individual, because she has such a fun personality and she's awesome at engaging with people, uh, we felt like really fostering her personality and those strengths interpersonally would be our focus. Um, and then looking at a skill that she had learned through her restaurant experience um, of going through receipts and doing a little bit of clerical work in the restaurants, um, we were able to then take those transferable skills paired with the value of using her personality and you know just how she's such a fun person to be around and pair that with work cultures that had types of tasks that may be clerical and repetitive like the receipts that she was reviewing in the restaurant setting but then also allowing her to be around certain office settings that encompassed a work culture of support uh, fun you know her first volunteer position that we started um, to get some job experience on her resume everyone in that office was just so much fun they were always joking around with each other um, just really family oriented it was a really really great experience for her and it showed that that clerical skill set she had that she had learned through the restaurant experience was able to be utilized in this office setting but she was also the, her favorite experience about this was getting to engage with uh, the different people in the work culture and how they had similar personalities to her and similar interests. And uh, when we're around those with similar interests and values, that ultimately makes it a more motivating experience. So using the envisioning technique really allowed this client to see an experience that could be uh, a good fit for her, but just something that she hadn't um, experienced before. And then another tool that might be useful for VR counselors in this envisioning area is using the question of where do you see yourself in three months or whatever your timeline might be of following up with them. Um, so even though I'm talking with my clients consistently throughout the month, we do our quarterly reviews every three months where you're evaluating goals and you're going through their plan and you're recognizing what needs to change, what is going well. Um, and in this time, that allows them to continue working through the change process. Um, and this question, I think, really evokes a lot of where they might be able to see themselves in that time period. And that gives you some ideas of how to shape their goals around that. Another technique uh, to elicit change talk with this particular client was using scaling rulers. So um, this is just using a scale of 1 to 10 paired with questions. And you know, it could be 1 to 5, whatever the, the uh, scale you want to use. But, um, with this client, I would say, you know, on a scale of one to 10, uh, you know, how physically exhausted are you today? And, you know, on a scale of one to 10, when we would come into a setting or be going into a setting, I would be scaling, you know, exactly where she was emotionally, um, physically. And then this really helped us to then use that data that we were recording based on how she felt before and after situations, um, how she was able to then assess okay, maybe the physical limitation of that part was a little bit too much for me, 
But I did really enjoy this, this aspect of working around pe these people with similar interests. So then that's when we continued to work through and get her those volunteer experience, like the office setting I explained. Um, and she worked in a couple of different office um, settings to continue to get that clerical exposure and uh, make her skill set more well-rounded. Um, and you know, through using these scaling rulers, it really just helped elicit that change talk and recognize her motivating factors. So we could continue implementing goals and working through any of these barriers that were occurring um, with her adjustment to her physical condition. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as I said earlier, with using evoking as a technique, um, using evocative questions. So uh, some examples of this would be, why is now a time to try something new? Uh, how could you make this happen? Uh, what would be the best way to get started? Um, so when you're using evocative questions, really be mindful of the way you're wording these. Again, they need to be open ended questions, but maybe also uh, focusing, focusing a little bit more on the what and the how. Um, you can throw some why questions in there, but maybe try not to make all of them why, because sometimes clients, um, the, the word why can sometimes send a client into thinking um, that they have to over explain something. So focusing on the what and the how can be a little bit more useful, but maybe throw in some whys in there too. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind when you're using the evocative questions to really um, evoke those strengths and values and keep uh, eliciting that change talk to see what that client particularly desires. So with this particular client, uh, looking at the double approach avoid conflict that was coming up with her sense of ambivalence, uh, often things I would hear were, I don't want to try something new because I know I was good at this before and it will be a quick placement. Um, again, this you know could be an effective uh, process for getting a, you know, a quick placement for that client so they could get to work and uh, be making a paycheck, but uh, really the client was hoping to find meaningful employment. So trying to help her recognize that discrepancy there of you want to approach doing something that is going to benefit your goals and your values and your strengths, but you're also avoiding that by saying, let's just do the quick, easy route. Um, also saying things like, I'm comfortable with this skill. Well, we found out that she was comfortable with certain skills in restaurants, but one of those skills was transferable that we could then uh, transfer into office settings and recreate through clerical tasks. Uh, also saying things like, I will try something new so I can get back to work, or I have learned new skills once, I can do it again. So again, just you know, working through wanting to approach that goal of change, but then when those feelings of ambivalence and avoidance come up, how can you work with the client to recenter them and help them focus on their values and strengths? So looking at the maintenance stage for this client, uh, she is continuing to regularly visit her doctor so she can not only be communicating um, with them about her physical changes, but then relaying that information to me as needed so we can make sure that we're consistent with uh, what plans her doctor has in place. Uh, continuing to work with the local VR state agency um, and also recently becoming a part of a new training program that is for individuals 55 and up. Um, so this is a huge success for this client because we have been searching for the right employment fit for a very long term period and to be able to finally come to a place of acceptance with uh, her physical disability and how a program like this may actually be very beneficial because the type of placements they are creating through this program is based on clerical skill set and the idea that there may be physical limitations in place and how can they foster the strengths during those moments. Um, so finally getting her to a place of recognizing that it's okay to try different experiences that might actually end up being super fulfilling, even if it wasn't that restaurant experience you had uh, long ago when you first started working. And then continuing to meet monthly to review goals. This is where some of the MI strategies might be coming up again. If I see that uh, when we're reviewing her goals, her employment objectives, if uh, some discrepancy is coming up again, how can we con continue to work through that together to um, highlight her values and her strengths and continue working towards additional positive changes? Um, and then, you know, just continuing to uh, encourage her to be involved in her community when she's volunteering and um, being a part of family oriented events and uh, those types of things are extremely valuable for her and ultimately improve her mental health and um, 
you know, decrease any of that stress that's occurring that's also kind of manifesting into the physical limitations that are happening. So just continuing to regularly monitor this client so she can continue to work towards positive change because as you can see, she has not effectively been placed in employment um, that is something that she is super motivated to do yet, but she has become motivated to continue through the process of trying something new. So. Um, thanks, I was wondering if we could take just a minute or two to, to kind of pull back from these specific cases sure. and just talk about what it's like for you incorporating MI skills and strategies into VR work. And I guess one thing that particularly stands out for me is um, the need for case closures, the need for mm -hmm. getting placements accomplished uh, so kind of a high-paced environment, and it seems like kind of a slow-paced approach. Mm -hmm. How do you bring those together? Yeah, it definitely is interesting because at times you feel like you have the pressure of wanting to get that client successfully working mm -hmm. and close that case and have them on to their you know, independent follow-along support. However, me as a counselor, I really want to work with the client to identify their values and strengths the mm -hmm. best I can. So just as I went through these different case studies and the different strategies I used, I think it's recognizing what works best with that client at the time. Okay. So, um, you know, with my first case study, really having one-on-one -on -one sessions with her and doing open-ended questions, affirmations, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But then the other two cases, things were a little bit different, right? So it's, it's just recognizing when those strategies can be the most effective to kind of keep the process on the right path mm -hmm. it needs to be on. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to lie, if there are times where I feel like it might be taking a little bit too long um, on a certain topic, then we might need to switch gears for a little bit and, okay. and, and use a different approach. Okay. I think that's the beauty of being a VR counselor. You can wear different hats and you can try different strategies. Right. Um, but when you do get into the situation where you feel like there's lack of motivation, but you see something in your client that you can evoke, mm -hmm. do it. Use mm -hmm. that time to keep going. Mm -hmm. But I think starting out with MI is a, is a great way to just go ahead and get it into your process with your case. Okay, so just to have some final notes, uh, why motivational interviewing for VR practice? Uh, the number one focus is motivation is important to seek employment. So if you're not able to identify the motivating factors in your client at that time, these strategies could be extremely useful in that area. Um, to then move on to promoting positive behavior change. Uh, utilizing that client-centered approach so you can really have that connection with your client um, and build that rapport with them and then make it very focused on their own personal goals. Um, having that collaborative relationship with them um, to again continue that rapport and continue, like I said, this is an ongoing cycle. So there's going to be other areas of change that come up. And if you continue to have that collaboration with your client, then ultimately you can continue to work towards positive change in other areas in the future. Um, and creating that goal-oriented communication. Uh, we know that in VR, goals are important so we can make things obtainable. Uh, so just creating that conversation around that. And then, you know, like I said here a moment ago, making this experience less stressful to explore reasons for change and what goals they truly want to make. We don't want this to make, a, make it be a stressful experience. We want this to be a positive experience. And uh, using these strategies can, you know, really evoke that by recognizing those strengths and values of your clients. All right, well, thank you so much for listening today, and um, that concludes our presentation. <clears throat> thank you, April. I will now turn it over to Heidi Decker-Mauer, uh, who with Chris Wagner, and I understand um, April has been uh, able to join us, so we will uh, move to our question and answer sort of discussion phase. So uh, you are up, Heidi. All right, thanks so much, Terry. And uh, thank you, April, for such a great presentation. There was a lot of super good information in there. I think for folks having um, examples to learn from, especially if, if there are successes, it's encouraging to help them kind of go out um, go out of maybe their comfort zone and to be able to try things that, that they maybe wouldn't have had they not heard about it working in certain circumstances. So thank you so much um, for that. And um, it was really great to have the question and answer session between you and Chris. Um, it kind of um, 
dug a little bit deeper and got a little bit of extra meaning for folks um, when it comes to those strategies. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, and um, I don't know if both of you want to answer or if one or the other wants to answer. Um, when you're ready to answer, I think just having the mic button pushed um, so there's not a line through it, then we'll be able to hear you. Um, the first question has to do with um, time for uh, helping folks out. Everybody's pressed for time these days uh, with their work and we all usually have much bigger workload than we have time for. In this particular question, Katie asks, if the client's case is closed because they're in long-term employment, how do you schedule them and continue to serve your new clients? Is there enough time in the working day to do that? So I think that's in regards to what April was saying about um, you know, just checking in, in with folks periodically to find out if things are still working out for them. Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, April, why don't you take that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so basically our clients that are in long-term employment supports at that time, we call that follow along category. And that allows us to still continue to check in on our clients at least twice a month as needed. Um, and honestly, sometimes the clients may not need support that month. They may shoot me just a text message and say, you know, I'm feeling really great about things this month and uh, let's, you know, schedule to have a in-person meeting in the next month. So again, it's really case to case. Um, but yeah, it, it can be hard, especially if you have a large caseload. Um, but that's when our time management skills come in as counselors and just really um, adjusting to which clients need the most support at that time. Excellent. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Not to that particular one, no. Sounds good. I'll move along to the next question. Teresa asks, how much interaction do you have with the employer in placing the young man with autism and did you use motivational interviewing with the employer? That's an interesting question. Um, so it's actually funny how I made this connection with that employer. Um, I was just looking at uh, some job leads that had been posted online that my mom actually had sent me. And she thought that it sounded like a really cool employer. You know, she knows what I do and, um, you know, we stick together in this field. Um, so she had sent me that and I just started thinking, wow, this sounds like a really cool environment. I just want to go check it out. So I, my initial meeting was with the human resources team. And this is a very small company. Um, their staff is probably under 10 people. Um, so I went and met with the HR team and they just, you know, loved what our mission was with helping individuals with disabilities um, obtain meaningful employment. And then from there, I met with the owner and the rest of the uh, management team. And I don't think I had to use motivational interviewing with them because their mission was to help those in need. Um, and they actually are a company that focused on hiring refugees. And we started to recognize that our missions were kind of similar in a sense. Um, you know, this individual with autism had difficulty with expressing himself, uh, like some of their employees that had language barriers. So we just really saw eye to eye. And I mean, honestly, it just ended up being a perfect match. And uh, we brought my client in to do a working interview and do those hands-on skills and really show them what he could do. And from there, they just, they knew he was one of their, uh, he was going to be an asset to their team, so. Excellent. Chris, did you have any, anything to add to that one? No, I actually was uh, noticing the other comments bubbling up mm -hmm. here. Yeah, yeah there. definitely. So um, in our Q&A panel, we have a question about the duration of time that April spent with the client from start to finish. Which particular client? The one that I was just discussing? I believe so. I think so. Let's see. We met, it was a pretty quick process, I would say. Um, I'm, I could not give you the exact you know, timeline right now because I don't have his file in front of me. Um, he's been working for two years now. Um, but we had met in the springtime, I know, when we did his intake, and then we took that that spring to be working through some working interview opportunities, going out and meeting um, employers in the community, 
and then he was placed by October. So oh wow, pretty pretty quick process. But yeah, um, again, it was just really building that rapport with him, understanding what he wanted for himself, and and helping him seek that change. And and we we made it happen. So fantastic! That April, sounds excellent. April, what about the timeline with the other two cases that you mentioned? Um, so the other two cases were a bit more long term, and I think that was because we we're really trying to pull out exactly what they did value, what their goals were. Um, although this this other client with autism, you know, he was a bit resistant to the process at first. Um, I do think I had a little bit more to work with as far as his strengths because he was still actively painting and doing photography and doing all this creative work. Um, but with the other two clients, it was really um, just helping them, you know, see what they wanted for themselves and and really recognizing what their goals were going to be. Um, so those durations were a bit longer. Um, again, the sec the first client that I had discussed, uh, she's been working for over a year now. Um, but I would say that process was up to a year in job development, but we were also using what we call community support services because I wanted to make sure I could spend plenty of time with her one-on-one uh, -on -one in the community or in her home setting to really be exploring her values and strengths. That makes a lot of sense. It sounds like if you have a little bit of information to go on in the first place, that can make things go more quickly, but having to, you know, uh, get that information from people about what they want and their values and beliefs um, that can it sounds like it can add a little bit of time to the process um, yes and the third case study I would say probably was the most lengthy because she was trying to adjust to her physical change and um, right. and that's still an ongoing process but we have some good things in the works so Excellent. We have a question from Sean. Ideas on how to balance ongoing resistance with DVR's need for progress. Any suggestions on how to address this in a safe, non-confrontational way? Uh, we did some training on nonviolent communication, which seems to be a good method. Mm -hmm. So that, that I'm sure that's a, an issue that people, uh, folks come up with um, uh, on on a regular basis, having to figure out how to help the person find their own motivation. Um, so what are your thoughts on, uh, on that with the, the, the client resistance and, uh, against DVR's wish for things to go quickly? Sure, and so April, I'll share a little bit about this and then maybe you could add in about the specific uh, people that you worked with. Okay, okay. great. Yeah, so, um, I guess to start, it's, I like to think about what is resistance and what's going on. Um, usually, I, I think it comes from a, a, a sense of lack of safety for the person. There's something about the environment, um, something about the situation, something about the way they're seeing themselves that um, makes them uncomfortable, nervous, a little unsure. And as you know, we're all wired uh, to have fight, flight, or freeze reactions when, when uh, we feel overwhelmed by things. And I think a lot of what I think of resistance is just that natural reaction to feeling unsafe, insecure. Um, and so then either fighting, actively getting resistant, freezing, you know, not showing up, not necessarily following through with things, um, or fleeing. We certainly have issues with, with dropout in our work. Um, and so what I want to do is really try to see from the inside out, what's it like for the person? Get in their bubble with them, make sure they feel me as a partner um, with them, that I'm not standing across trying to push something uh, on them. The, this is a challenge across all kinds of settings, um, but it's not the client's, it's not the consumer's responsibility to meet our uh, demands that we get placed on us by work environments. And so it's, it's one that we often are having to manage in ourselves to not 